Alex Sigley had, as Kieran Gilbert just told us there, tried hard to keep clear of any political comment while he was in North Korea. But three months ago, he did write an article for The Guardian newspaper in which he called it a militaristic society. That was perhaps the only thing you could say was critical. But he went on to explain why he was there. He said, I'd been interested in socialism ever since studying the Russian Revolution at high school, while my sinologist father, Chinese mother and childhood love of Japanese anime had sparked a passion for Chinese and Japanese. And he added that he had just said goodbye to his North Korean roommate and he added, the fact that an Australian and a New York North Korean could happily share a room for four months does show there is a better way we can get along. Well, joining me is someone who went on one of the tours that Alex Sigley ran in North Korea, Sky News producer Trudy McIntosh, who took these pictures of him and her and their group. Trudy, it's lovely to see you. Um, what kind of person is Alex Sigley? Well, thanks, Andrew. I found him to be a very intelligent young man. He was very passionate about Korea um, and Korean culture. As you said, um, I met him on a tour that was run, being run whilst I was at the ANU studying there, studying international relations. Um, I found him to be uh, yeah, a very passionate person about the Korean culture. He could speak fluent Korean and during my time, the week that I spent there with him, he was very keen to interact with the locals. And what did he say to you about North Korea? Um, well, he was... Before we went on the trip, he warned us of some of the do's and don'ts about what to do in North Korea. As you, you know and, and the viewers would know, um, it's a very secretive state and there's... Um, they have very strict rules and regulations about what can and can't be done. For example, there was restrictions around what you could take photographs of. Um, you're not allowed to crop a photograph in of the statues of the leaders. That was something that really has stuck with me five years later. Such a small thing, but um, something they were very vigilant about when we were there. And he was warning of, you know, don't fall foul of these kind of things. And when, when he was giving you these warnings, I mean, there's almost an implicit criticism, I guess, in that. But did he actually explicitly criticise North Korea at all? No, not, not to me um, at all. As I said, I know him just from that time and I've spoken to him subsequently um, about kind of his thoughts on North Korea. He was never critical to me and I think that's um, interesting in itself that he's, he's so passionate about... His company was called Tongil Tours, which in Korean means reunification. He, to me, seemed to be very passionate about trying to find a way to see if the two Koreas could be reunited. Well, when you were there... Um... With all these warnings and what you know of uh, North Korea, the Otto Warmbier case and all that kind of stuff, um, did you feel safe? Did you feel at any stage, you know, well, look, crikey, if I put a foot wrong, I'm in trouble here? There was definitely a feeling of that. I remember very vividly we flew in from Beijing to Pyongyang and as you land in there, this real sense of fear as you go through customs and um, get your passport stamped and things like that, it's just... A real sense of unease um, and one thing I do remember where I was on a group with other people um, from Canberra and there was talk about do we even refer to it as North Korea? I think as the, the week went on it was something you, you did refer to it as but to start with you were even cautious of to call it North Korea because as you know that they consider themselves the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Mm, dearie me. So looking around, I mean I know with those tours often interaction with locals as in not people hand-picked and all that, but interaction is, is limited. What did you see and what impression did you form of North Korea? Like, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's easy, I guess, to demonise it, but sometimes, of course, reality is as bad as uh, the demonisation. Tell us what you actually... what impression you actually formed. Well, I think the important thing to note here is that these tours are very cocooned, that from the minute you get off the plane to the minute you get out of the country, you're followed by three North Korean minders who are kind of with you at all times, making sure nothing goes wrong. By the end, we started to get a feeling amongst the group about um, what was being staged before you. You'd go into a big banquet hall where there was plates on every table, but there was only food on ours. The kind of feeling goes, oh, there's heaps of people staying at this hotel, but in reality, we were the only people there. And mm. that sort of pageantry and performance for Western tourists, I found that very interesting and a bit um, unsettling, to be honest. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. 
Yeah, it's so sad then to see with all the precautions he's taken that is Now, we don't know that he's been arrested, but, you know, obviously that's the number one suspicion. You must be as surprised, uh, apparently, as his family seems to be, that he's been arrested. That's right. Like, of, of all the people that I went on tour with, and, you know, he was the leader, but I would never have expected it when I saw the news this morning. I was genuinely shocked that this is the person that I went with, you know. He did genuinely have such a love for the country, from what I could tell. Obviously, that's five years ago. Who knows what's happened in the intervening period? But, yeah, just a shocking... Um, hopefully, it's just a misunderstanding and he can be uh, let out, you know, safely as his poor family at home. I uh, endorse that completely. Trudy McIntosh, thank you so much indeed for your time. Thanks, Andrew. I do wonder whether he has become a bargaining chip for Kim Jong-un to uh, get Trump to the table and extract a concession in exchange for releasing this guy we just caught. He called himself the last Australian living in uh, North Korea. I think uh, once he's freed and out, he'll be the last, and I don't think there'll be another for a long time.